uh, personal introduction. My background includes and president of the American Association of Port Authorities. Uh, another decade as CEO of the North Carolina State Ports Authority, followed by a stint in the consulting sector uh, in the port industry where I focused uh, among some other things, but my, my attention was really driven on asset management, education, and advocacy. And four years ago, I was asked to come to the Lamar University uh, to start up the Center uh, for Port Management. Uh, North America's first and only fully online master's degree program centered on port management. So the, to you all, welcome uh, to the task committee's uh, first webinar since our uh, revitalization um, about a year back, uh, thanks to ASCE uh, uh, through the asset management task committee. I want to first thank the task committee leadership and organizers of this webinar, uh, Patricia Gaynor uh, uh, at the Maritime Administra Administration, who is the supervisory engineer, but does so much more at the Maritime Administration. She's the vice chair, and appropriately so. She previously was at the Maryland Port Administration and has been engaged in asset management on a, on a practical level uh, for a number of years. Daniel Elroy, uh, who's the founder and owner of North South GIS. Uh, uh, Ryan Tarbot, uh, who as the U.S. representative to ISO 55000 and asset manager, uh, subject matter expert at SNC Lavalin. Um, Todd Neely, who works at North South GIS as well as uh, doing his own gig uh, for Neely Consulting. Um, but these folks have been critical in developing the, the uh, task committee agenda, uh, as well as uh, organizing this webinar. Uh, all of these folks have been engaged in, uh, and in the exploration and uh, uh, dissemination of asset management principles uh, for a number of years, some of us uh, well over a decade. I would like to highlight Daniel. Daniel, I've known for a good long while, has been particularly involved in developing um, uh, the SharePoint site, which serves as our um, uh, an excellent platform for sharing knowledge and lessons learned. <clears throat> I'll thank uh, Ryan again for taking a speaking role here. Ann Porter at the Port of Seattle, Christopher uh, McGrath, at the Port of San Diego, Mo Mofrad and Sean Smith at the Port of Vancouver for taking time to develop uh, remarks uh, reflecting their port's uh, development of asset management. And finally, I'd like to thank ASCE and COPRI for their support in advancing the state of the practice of asset management. And to particularly note the great staff support by uh, Sean Herpelsheimer, uh, COPRI coordinator. I do believe that uh, ASAE and COPRI serve as a great platform for asset management uh, advancement, a business practice whose time has come. The title of our webinar is Tales of Success Along the Way to Strategic Management. We first from Ryan Tarbert, who will cast a wide net over the brief history of strategic asset management development in North America and where we are today. Uh, then we'll turn to our three West Coast Port Authorities, authority representatives who will speak to their experiences in developing AM business processes and the early benefits that they gained along the way. To save time, all of our speakers will self-introduce. And Ryan, if you will please get us started. Uh, before I get just one last quick sound check. Am I coming through okay? <clears throat> awesome. All right. Thumbs up. Great. And see if technology shines well on us today. Is my screen coming through okay? Just uh, can I get a, an audio approval or a thumbs up, Eric, that my slide's okay? You look good. All right. Great. Thanks. Well, thank you for having me, everybody. Um, 
As Eric mentioned, uh, we'll, we're self-introducing. My name's Ryan Tarbett. Um, I am the former head of the U.S. delegation to ISO 55000, and for the last few years, I've been the sitting chair of the U.S. technical advisory group to ISO 55000. Um, and probably like everybody on this call, or nearly most of us, um, I fell into asset management purely by the forces of, of the world around me. Um, my background is GIS um, in the municipal space, and uh, I've been a consultant in the private industry in the GIS world, uh, as well as have worked for uh, local, state, and federal um, employers over the years. Uh, I've been with SNC Lavalin um, for about five years now. Um, I'm a global asset management SME. I'm not an expert per se in the port space, um, but I am an expert in asset management as a management system for the management of assets. And that's what I'm going to spend a couple of minutes talking about. Um, and hopefully uh, it will um, provide an, a nice footing for everybody um, in this in this webinar. So I'm just going to start off with posing a very basic question. What is strategic asset management? Um, and quite frankly, uh, you know, a lot of folks have into words. Um, and when it is put in words, uh, I think a lot of folks don't fully appreciate, uh, frankly, the, the, the simplicity or the elegance of it in a nutshell. Um, all the complicated stuff sort of comes out after you crack that. But it is the optimal use of assets by the organization in pursuit of objectives. And the key piece here is by the organization. This is a top-down senior management leadership exercise. Strategic asset management is a management system, just like your financial management system, not software, but the controls and the people and the process and the outcomes of that system. Um, so it's by the organization. It's not by the engineering department. It's not by the maintenance department. It's by the port as a living organism. It's the port's optimal use of assets in pursuit of the port's overall business objectives. And to put this into, into harder context, you can ask yourself, what is your port in the business of doing? Fundamentally, what is it in the business of doing? And you could ask, am I in the business of owning and managing and renewing fenders and rails and birth and mass lights and you name it? Is, is that what I'm in the business in? Or do those things all necessarily have to come along for the ride? Because what I'm really in the business in of running my port is providing mobility and, and that might be a, a charged word and we'll we'll take a look at that here over the next slide or two but is is your port in the business of making everything on the right hand side happen is it is it a fundamental mechanism in the way the world works that makes the things on the right happen and therefore all the things on the left become necessary in order for grain to be imported and exported in order for us to go down to the car lot and buy a new car, for us to have wind farms, to go to our local gas station slash hamburger stand and buy lunch and, and get the tank filled up at the same time. Um, so so we when we think about strategic asset management, it's it's how do we use the hardware that we have to provide value? OK, so one of my biggest projects of the last few years has been working with the New York City Metropolitan Authority, and they have three different railroad systems, uh, the New York subway system, bridges and tunnels. Um, over uh, hundreds and hundreds of thousands of, of bus rides per day, their assets at the New York MTA on the left, their only assets when they actually do what we see on the right, when they move people from A to B. The New York MTA is in the business of moving people. 
And their subways and subway stations are only assets to them when they can move people. Otherwise, they become quite expensive liabilities. So strategic asset management, and I kind of did this on purpose for, for fun. Um, I went online and <clears throat> just Googled um, port commission meetings for uh, the, the, the that are speaking today. So those are the, the three shots you see there on the left. But strategic asset management is how the organization, the top of the organization, manages the infrastructure that it has to create value. That is what strategic asset management is about, is how top leadership manages infrastructure to create value, which is a core tenant of ISO 55000 and asset management, is that assets are a means to an end. They're not the end unto themselves. We can have non-asset solutions. We can outsource assets. We can do all kinds of clever things, public-private partnerships, um, you name it, uh, to create the value. So they're just a means to an end. Um, so the standards themselves, uh, and this is, I think, where a lot of pitfalls exist uh, when any organization gets started on an asset management journey, is the misconception um, or the, uh, the, the ignorance, which is very different from stupidity. Uh, it, it, there's a lot of voices out there in the market about what asset management is. Um, and it is a management system for the management of assets. It's not a copy of Maxmo or N4. It's, it's not software. It's not data collection per se. It's the management system that wraps around all of those things that gets the entire organization rowing its boat in the same direction to deliver value from the asset portfolio. And, uh, you know, it's a little tongue in cheek maybe, but um, I can't overemphasize that asset management is not um, an exercise of the patients running the asylum. Um, and this is where I see a lot of asset management programs get very expensive and get very sideways very quickly, is that there is not a clear linkage between what the goals and objectives of the organization, in this case ports, are, and how it will use its infrastructure assets to achieve those goals and objectives. That, that's an that's a executive management level thinking process. And what we're seeing here, uh, I've laid out in this little grid, are core business capabilities that are looked for um, by, by ISO 55,000 practitioners like myself. Um, and, and all of us should be looking for when we think about engaging in strategic asset management. These are, these are core business capabilities uh, captured in both the 55,000 standards Here in red, this is the Institute for Asset Management, and this is a maturity assessment guide for these core strategic asset management business capabilities. When an organization sets about undertaking strategic asset management and it has not looked itself in the mirror and really put a measure against its own maturity, its own capabilities to actually succeed in carrying out strategic asset management, failure looms. Um, and without systematically doing an assessment against these types of capabilities, the organization is, doesn't know where the failure potentials exist. And all too often, we all hear the horror stories. I spent seven figures on this and high six figures on that, and God forbid, eight figures on the next thing for asset management, and it failed. It got me nowhere. And nine times out of 10, what I see is the organization, A, did not have top-down executive leadership that clearly understood the linkage between the use of infrastructure assets and the delivery of value, and B, the actual business capabilities needed to be present and mature enough weren't there for asset management to succeed. So, uh, you know, um, that's, that's 
that just tends to be the way it goes. So this is my last slide. Um, and these are, uh, this is an expression of those business capabilities we just look like, looked at. And very colorful, the take home point here is top management on the left needs to understand down through the layers of the organization. And, and, and what you're seeing on the right, uh, all those columns, you'll see department one, department two, department three, four, five, six, seven, current state. So all these business capabilities exist at various levels of maturity or they all, um, and they exist unevenly across the different business units or departments within a port. And the time scales over which these different capabilities can be matured um, are going to vary by department and by business capability. So when we set about implementing a strategic asset management program, um, it's very important that we have this kind of a framework to work from, uh, certainly as, as top management, so that we can properly gauge and properly roadmap how we're going to actually roll the system out successfully and the types of resourcing uh, and the timing of those resourcings uh, that will be needed. So with that, um, it's just a little slide uh, that Daniel put together um, showing uh, ports that have known GIS activity. Uh, so uh, in my own words, why GIS activity? Um, well, it just so happens that a very high percentage of our infrastructure uh, is held within GIS. That uh, tends to be the asset register um, that that defines how much of it we have, where it is, um, is, is in the GIS. And so here's some ports uh, that have some known asset management activity, uh, some more than others. And then uh, drilling into today's speakers. So uh, the Port of Seattle, uh, we have Ann Porter who will be presenting um, the Port of Seattle. Uh, Port of San Diego with Christopher McGrath giving a, a, a presentation. And the Port of Vancouver with Mo Moffred and uh, Sean Smith giving a presentation. So uh, with that, um, I'm gonna turn it over to uh, our first speaker. Thank you so much. All right, I think I'm ready. Are you able to hear and hear me and see my slides? We've got you. Sound great. Yay. Thank you. Well, thank you, Ryan. I think that um, this is what you've set up has, is going to dovetail very well into my presentation, which is probably a, a case study of um, very, very early uh, management systems um, to achieve organizational goals. Um, so just first, uh, in the introduction for me is, um, uh, my name is Ann Porter. Um, I'm the Director of Seaport Project Management at the Port of Seattle. Um, I'm a professional civil engineer. I recently completed an MBA. Um, and I worked for the Port for about 26 years, providing project management for waterfront capital projects. Um, but the last year and a half, I've um, been the director for project management, supporting a team of about, of about 19 project managers and project control staff in planning, design, constructing waterfront capital projects. And then I'm a recent member of the ASCE Ports and Harbors COPRI and their asset management subcommittee. So the Port of Seattle is, is located in Washington State, um, and we operate both an airport and a seaport. So for today's presentation, I'm just talking about the seaport. Um, a large portion of our seaport is operated jointly with the Port of Tacoma under the Northwest Seaport Alliance, which is a port development authority. So I'm gonna go through a couple photos showing you some of our typical assets. 
Uh, this is uh, an international cargo terminal. Right now it's being considered for conversion to a new cruise terminal in the north end. Um, this is uh, this is uh, one of our existing cruise terminals that was grossly utilized in 2020 due to COVID. Um, and in addition, there's a, a conference center and a restaurant in the center, a recreational marina, and then across the street is our World Trade Center facility. This is our Port of Seattle headquarters, and it's also a passenger ferry terminal for the Victoria Clipper running service between the U.S. and Canada. Uh, this is the Shoshone Bay Marina. Um, we have over 1,400 slips and about 300 liveaboards at this marina. It's one of the largest recreational marinas um, in the state of Washington. And then Fisherman's Terminal is, is the oldest facility at the port. It serves the Alaska fishing fleets, vessel services, and then we've got multiple upland businesses there. So that's just a sampling. We have about 20 different terminals and, and sites that we operate. So this is just a, an outline of what I'm covering today. I'm going to go over the last 10 years of development and in asset conditions tracking. Um, we've uh, got 12 programs. I'll talk some cross departmental coordination um, investments that we've made as a result and some of the challenges, some of the problems that we're facing. Um, and, and I think that will tie in nicely to some of what Ryan had just presented. And then I'll talk about next level. So what, what's our next step? Where do we go from here? How can we improve upon what we've already built? So this is a listing of our, our current programs. Um, we have about a dozen. Um, some are more self-explanatory than others, so I'm going to quickly go through each program. Um, Arc Flash looks at the, the health of substations. It's managed by our electrical engineers in our design department. Bridges are inspected um, also from by our engineering department. Um, building tune-ups, um, focus on energy and water, also managed by engineering. Um, is the annual walkthrough by um, crews, um, our maintenance crews, that are looking for obvious condition issues at all of our sites. Uh, we have a, a HVAC program that's a collaboration between maintenance and engineering. Um, we do an uh, annual inventory um, update. So they look at one third of the total seaport inventory every year. So it's it's on a three make sure the the books are correct in terms of what assets are still being used and um, any that have been demolished or removed from the books um, we also try to of course do that when we do capital projects at the end of the project um, update the the accounting books um, for finance purposes um, parking garages, similar to bridges, our engineers um, inspect those regularly. Uh, our maintenance department looks at roofing. And then we do a thing called roundtables. And this is something our project management department does every year where we um, do some cross departmental coordination with, um, I'll show you all the departments in a bit, but um, just look for issues, what's come up in the E condition surveys that might rise to the level of needing um, to be a budget item, whether it's a significant maintenance expense or a capital project. Water um, program is the only one that has a, a GIS component, um, and that is because we operate our own uh, utility. And then we also have a underdock inspection program um, that the project management group um, collaborates with the engineering department on. Um, and lastly, we have a vertical conveyance or elevator program that our maintenance department runs. So what I'm trying to emphasize here is the uh, decentralized nature of what we do. So we've got a bit in maintenance, a bit in engineering, some in project management, and then stormwater is their own entity. So we're, we're very decentralized. 
And well, these are excellent programs that are happening. There's plenty of areas we're not yet looking at systematically. So we still have a lot of work to do going forward with that goal of, of balancing costs of what it takes to track these conditions with the benefits of meeting the program objectives and of course meeting our business objectives. So a lot of the documents, uh, fendering bollards, utilities, bulkheads, floating docks, water lines, lift stations, pavements, signage, lighting, parks, other things. There's plenty that we don't look at systematically, but we try to catch in the e-condition surveys and in our roundtables. So cross-departmental coordination, I talked a little bit about some of the programs have this already. Um, and these are the departments that are, are collaborating. So our, all of our property managers, our operation managers, um, project management, the environmental team, uh, our maintenance department, and our engineering folks. And then as a result of the programs, we have made significant investments in asset renewal. So the, um, the upside is that we've got aging facilities, um, some over 50 years old, and these are some of the, the capital projects or the types of capital projects that reflect recent investments or future investments um, in our budgets. And they result directly from our conditions tracking program. So dock rehabilitations, bulkhead replacements, building renovations, HVAC, roofing, um, elevator replacements, utilities, and substations are some of the, the major ones. So as an example, our most significant investments in asset renewal have been in dock rehabilitations. And we really needed that under dock inspection program to be able to move forward with this. Um, so this picture shows construction in progress, working around terminal operations. You can see all the, the a number of the deck panels have been removed so that they create access um, stair, um, stairways that go down to uh, work underneath the apron, repairing deck panels and pile caps. What are the challenges? So these are some of the problems that we've got with our current program. Um, it's not centralized. So we have way too many people involved, too many departments. The, the data is kept all over the place. Um, so sometimes it's hard to track down and it's not as easily accessible as like it to be. Um, the information is not always timely and, and that's very important for property managers having those conversations operating um, tenants that operate the terminals. Um, they need that awareness so that they can time uh, future investments. Um, so confidence in the data accuracy varies. So if you don't have the right expertise out on the site, not, maybe they're not analyzing the data when it comes in. Um, there's, there's a problem with how confident are you that you're getting accurate data. Um, we also have a, a variety of reporting formats. So decision makers um, or sponsors um, are getting a lot of information brought to them, but it's not always in the, um, an easily digestible format. And then standardization. So all the programs do things a bit differently and uh, probably could benefit some, from some standardized approaches. And then those gaps in the programs I mentioned before. So turning those challenges into questions about where do we want to go to expand and improve the existing programs. Um, we just turned all these into questions. So do we want a centralized approach to the data management? Or can we just keep it in multiple locations but better manage it? Um, can we manage our processes across multiple departments? Um, can we improve the timeliness, increase accuracy? Can our reports be more consistent? Um, what should be standardized? And, and do we try to fill those gaps? So what do the customers want? Um, if you want to improve your product, you should ask your customers. So that's what we did. Um, this uh, stakeholder diagram shows data providers, data users. Top half represents those who are in the business of collecting the data 
providing analysis and making recommendations. Um, you see project management, terminal operations, engineering, maintenance, and finance. And then the bottom half is really our sponsors, our, our customers and end, user, end users who are managing the tenants, the operations, the business development, and they have the responsibility for their budgeting um, for major projects and capital plans. So we met with the heads of, of these departments um, on the customer side, these we call the maritime directors. Um, these are the key operating and business groups. Um, we have our commercial ops, fishing, recreational boating, um, economic development, maritime portfolio is our upland side of the business. Um, um, stormwater utilities, marine maintenance, and then the Northwest Seaport Alliance, which are our cargo operations that are jointly operated with the Port of Tacoma. Um, Seattle is, is known as the North Harbor. Um, and so we met with all of the, the heads of these um, departments and asked what do they want to get out of the program? Uh, they didn't like calling it a problem because they thought we were doing a pretty good job already or, or we at least done quite a bit of work on, on developing those 12 different programs. So they wanted to call it an opportunity. And jointly they came up with this opportunity statement to agree on standards and accountability for consistent collection, organization, communication of actionable asset condition data, leading to high confidence in strategic investments. It's kind of a mouthful, so there's a lot packed in there. Um, and so we, we then asked them, um, how would we know if we were successful in the next level of developing the program? And that led to this list of objectives. So the data would be readily accessible. Um, it would be accurate, or you'd have that higher confidence level in the accuracy. Um, it would be comprehensive. So you would see terminal by terminal what what their ratings were for things like level of service and, and fit for purpose. And prioritization. So what's the level of urgency? Um, is this thing going to shut down operations? Will it have a disruption impact? Um, or is it something we can take our time and, and plan for in the next three to five years? Um, and then timely. So as soon as the, an issue is discovered, are the um, end users getting that information in a timely manner? So pursuing the, the, the stated opportunity, um, it really required us to look at where accountability should reside, which department should really own this responsibility. Um, our airport has an entire department, um, facilities and infrastructure that handles asset management. The non-aviation efforts are uh, very decentralized um, because there are Essentially, there's three different, or really four different operating divisions in um, between economic development, maritime, the Northwest Seaport Alliance, and then our, our stormwater utility. So here's what we considered as, as optional departments for accountability. Our maintenance folks, um, a planning department, engineering, project management, or should there be a new department similar to what we see on the aviation side? Uh, working with our stakeholders, our, our customer group, their preferred option was to keep it with maintenance. Um, and there's a lot of reasons for this. There's, we went through a, a whole pros and cons analysis. Um, they were preferred um, for centralizing data collection and communication because they've got access to the assets. They're the boots on the ground, providing um, ability, understanding, connection, awareness of conditions based on their day-to-day -day site presence. Um, and in addition, the current, the e-condition surveys that they do, the assessment reports, they're very streamlined. They link to um, property sites that the Northwest Seaport Alliance has ac access to through an external SharePoint um, site, and they are also linked to our financial systems, um, which are uh, PeopleSoft and uh, Maxima. 
So another advantage um, is that they've got a stake in the outcome since they're doing a lot of the work on site in terms of repairs. Um, so they're more likely to be engaged in understanding of condition issues, um, being responsible for the, the regular operations. They're the first ones who are called when there's an emergency. Um, they're also involved in our roundtable um, post to property sites. Um, they're timely um, and it improves the accuracy and communication about condition issues. Really, it's the communication between the, the maintenance managers and the property and operations managers. So what's needed to, to move us forward in, in this recommendation was um, rather than a whole department, we recommended let's start with one full-time employee that's hired and dedicated to coordinate all the programs in order to address challenges and meet the high level objectives. And these are some of the actions. So we needed that agreement on who had the overall accountability, um, identified the department. Um, we need to hire the resources to manage it. We haven't done that yet. Um, and we wanted to preserve that cross department coordination. We wanted more consistency between programs. Um, we wanted to keep our costs low, um, have some efficiencies. So look for redundancies and try to eliminate those. Um, and we wanted the reporting to be more useful for the users, defining those programs, how we can fill the gaps in, in the programs that have not yet developed. So this is just a summary of, of our lessons learned and what the benefits of, of the process that we just went through. Um, just appreciating how complex um, it is to work across multiple sites, lines of business, um, prioritizing the work, um, the importance of socializing the benefits, getting that managerial and financial support for the efforts. So unlike Ryan's presentation, we didn't really feel like we had a top-down directive to do this work. Um, it, it came from um, the data providers who were collecting asset condition um, information. Uh, prioritizing those programs. Um, so really assessing what, what's the urgency, where can we get the most value driven results. Um, standardization is something that needed to be considered to improve those efficiencies. And then budgeting for the work when it's needed and when it's least disrupt disruptive um, was important for operations. So not tracking asset conditions um, can be like living under a fog, never knowing when the next repair need will pop up. And tracking these can clear the fog, guide our strategic investments in asset renewals and eventual replacement. Um, and this is Elliott Bay and our Seattle waterfront. Well, that concludes my presentation. Thank you for listening. Thank you, Anne. Thank you, Anne. Well, let's turn, well, let's uh, turn uh, further down the coast down to the Christopher coast. McGrath and talk to us a little talk bit more about uh, asset management in the context of the Unified Port District of San Diego. Thank you, Eric. I am trying to share my screen right this moment. Seems to be a little sluggish. There we go. Uh, so good job, Ann. Um, I am Christopher McGrath. And I am a um, manager at the engineering or at the Port of San Diego's engineering department, uh, and I, my primary task is leading the asset management implementation for the district. Uh, I'm a licensed civil engineer, uh, and like many of you leading asset management for your organizations, I have many other jobs. Uh, I appreciate the opportunity to discuss asset management with all of you today. So a uh, little high level here, I'm going to talk to you a little bit about the Port of San Diego in general, um, give you what we do. Um, we're going to explore our journey of asset management. Um, I'm going to highlight some of the successes that we've had along the way as well. Back There we go. Uh, so 
about us. The Port of San Diego serves the people of California. Um, we were created by the state legislature in 1962. And uh, a really important thing for us here is that we are self-sustaining from our revenue generation and grants. Um, we do not tax any of our tenants on the waterfront. Uh, we haven't done so since 1970. Uh, we have 34 miles of coastline, 2,400 acres of land, and 3,500 acres of water. And, and put that all in context, we essentially own, maintain, all of the waterfront property around the entire San Diego Bay, uh, excluding only the uh, federal lands. Uh, we're made up of five different member cities, uh, Coronado, San Diego, National City, Chula Vista, and Imperial Beach. Our responsibilities to the people of California are outlined in our governing legislation, the Port Act and Tidelands Trust Doctrine directs the port to manage the Bay and Tidelands on behalf of all citizens of the state of California. Uh, and going back to what do we maintain, our boundary is defined by the mean high tide line around the Bayfront. We're made up of a board of commissioners from the member cities. There are seven members in total. One from each of the uh, member cities, except for the city of San Diego, which has three representatives. A little snapshot of our budget uh, pre-COVID, little asterisks, uh, prior to the impacts of the current uh, pandemic. We had roughly $193 million in total revenue generated from our tenants, uh, be it in the cargo, uh, in cruise industries, as well as primarily our real estate portfolio, which makes up 60% of our revenue, uh, and then our harbor police and parking services. We're the fourth largest port in California uh, with two cargo terminals and two cruise terminals. We're also considered one of 17 strategic ports for the United States. It's a very important designation, making our Marine terminals are structured so to provide the infrastructure and services necessary to support military deployment activities. Uh, we can receive notification uh, within 24 hours to be prepared to perform operations on behalf of the U.S. government. We, in addition to being a maritime uh, industry port, we also have public parks. We have marinas, we have museums, hotels, restaurants, uh, a retail shopping center, uh, commercial space, uh, and we offer sports fishing uh, and events as well. A little economic impact analysis that we performed in 2017. Uh, really important highlight here to our agency is not very large for the region, but we do have quite a uh, financial impact on the region here with $9.4 billion at the end of 2017. To operate such an important engine, we must manage our assets effectively. So in comes enterprise asset manager. We've always had a way to make decisions and maintain our assets, uh, but now we have evolved into a data-informed decision-making organization with attention to risk prioritization. A little about our, the, the fundamental part of our asset management system is our asset inventory. We've identified over 91,000 assets, which are comprised of our two cargo terminals, our two cruise terminals, uh, multiple piers, wharfs, and floating docks, uh, a large quantity of large, medium, and small buildings, uh, one shopping center, as I mentioned, over 11 million square feet of pavement, 22 public parks, three public boat launches, and 70 uh, art pieces. So your journey in asset management may oh. appear to be a straight path, but it never is. You know, I, these pictures are not in San Diego, but it is the most Googled photo of a winding road. And I think that the asset management journey is truly a winding road. Uh, this road also happens to be my favorite road to drive in the country. Uh, you see, I come from a small island community at the end of this road in Wisconsin. 
Growing up on the island meant that maritime has always been a part of my life. Uh, from my first job in high school, where I managed all the shipments delivered daily to the island. Uh, and that meant everything. There's no other way to get uh, freight to the island except by ferry. Uh, so I spent many years working on those ferries. Um, oops, jump back again. There we go, back to where it was. Uh, after leaving the island, I moved on to the University of Colorado. I earned my civil engineering degree there. Uh, and after college, I made my way to San Diego's amazing waterfront. I've been here for 15 years. Uh, and my family and I now live in the coastal community of Point Loma. So I live, breathe, and eat Port of San Diego uh, most days of the week. Um, my experience, though, began with a consulting firm. I was an uh, engineer doing planning, design, and construction uh, in the civil engineering field. And then I joined the port in 2015 to lead the implementation of asset management as well as manage the port uh, many, uh, programs. This role has led to a deep integration for myself within the operations teams of our facilities, real estate, and maintenance departments. Uh, beyond my work at the Port of San Diego, I am also a director of the American Public Works Association Regional Chapter. I've been appointed to the National Asset Management Technical Committee for, Asset, for APWA, and I also participate on this committee. Closely, it appears the road is straight in every one of these pictures, uh, but no matter what, you always have to turn the wheel sooner or later. Uh, your asset management journey is going to be similar. Uh, believe me, I've tried many times to go straight. So our asset management timeline, we started out with a straightforward five year plan. We were going to implement an ISO 55001 certified asset management program and provide a state of the art asset management system to the port. Uh, things came up along the way. Two of the most common twists in the road occur when people move in and out of the team and when priorities must compete for dollars and resources. Uh, but I don't think I have to explain this to you. Another twist is organizational readiness. The port fully supported the implementation of enterprise asset management, but there were parts of our organization that weren't ready for such a great change. More time was needed to be spent on those parts individually before our full vision could be implemented for asset management. Finally, you know, we've got to throw in acts of God with uh, coronavirus this year, uh, but two years ago, we also faced a cyber attack, uh, which set us back technology-wise for a short period of time. Uh, but there was a silver lining to the cyber attack. Uh, it introduced a slew of new technology that we didn't have access to, and in the long run, has helped us to improve our asset management system. After five years, uh, leading this effort, I can say our journey has looked much more like this than the straight path on the last slide. The initial step taken was to develop the asset inventory that I had described. Uh, we accomplished that through boots on the ground identification and a review of all our available as builts. Each asset was evaluated in a risk prioritization software using a calculated consequence of failure and a potential of failure to generate the 10 year project plan. Uh, and that project plan, when it came out in 2016, recommended that the district spend uh, roughly $15 million per year for the next 10 years in order to catch up on its deferred maintenance. Uh, it was important for us to establish the data informed project selection process early on. Uh, as shown in the earlier presentation, we have boards who make decisions, what they wanted from us when it came to uh, project decision making was really to not have it be a personal decision, but more data informed, as I said, and that's what our asset management program does for the organization. Once we completed that first phase of asset inventory and prioritization, uh, we moved into creating our new enterprise asset management system. We intended to bring in a new system uh, for maintenance management that also was infused with asset rich data. Um, but during the process, we engaged during that process, we did engage our departments across the organization and developed technical requirements that would support everyone's needs. 
a big part of this is getting buy-in from everyone across the organization and not driving this home with one department. Uh, through the process, we came full circle uh, to consider existing enterprise systems and determined reconfiguration would be in our best interest. The technical requirements then became our tasks and milestones rather than uh, checks for whether or not we wanted to purchase a new system. We moved then on to the establishment of our system architecture. We built our own enterprise asset management system on top of our existing SAP, ArcGIS, and Microsoft Power Apps infrastructure. Uh, all systems we already had enterprise licensing for, but really weren't tapping the potential of. Since we were forging our own path, we had to develop a proprietary data model. Uh, and this is where we spent a lot of time asking ourselves, what do we want to know about our assets? The data model can be the single most difficult step of enterprise asset management implementation, but it is likely the most important step you'll go through. We held workshops with all the stakeholders again to learn how deep they wanted to get into an asset, would they want to know about that asset, and how did they want to measure it. There are many applications on the market to help you manage your data, create connectors between the systems you have to transfer the data seamlessly. We chose to move forward what we had, and that was Microsoft Power Apps and Azure to um, create a da data warehouse server. So everything lives within that right now for our asset management. And both were developed by our port staff, um, which is really uh, an amazing feat. Our folks internally took the time to build the data model, um, set up the Azure database, as well as actually create the Power App application. Um, what that I think doesn't, it's important to highlight is it created the skills for us to perform continuous improvement without hiring additional consultants. A lot of times with the bigger systems you purchase, you'll need to go back to a consultant to have them actually make the improvements you want along the way. Our asset data manager application was designed entirely using the Power Apps platform, and I'll show you some examples, uh, screenshots from that in a little bit. Uh, it allows our users to access and modify our asset information, view and take photos, uh, view and add geolocation on the map for each asset and provides a link to Google Maps for directions too. You can perform an asset inspection and submit service requests to address immediate needs all within the application. All the modifications to any asset information or inspection that's performed along the way follow a review process in the application so that data is validated prior to going into the asset inventory. Yeah, it's important. You know, good data in, in means good information out. Um, garbage in, garbage out is the other way of saying that. In preparation to develop our mobile workforce application, we evaluated our existing maintenance business processes. Uh, this was a process where we went through an evaluation of our application function, the best industry practices for maintenance, as well as our current processes. They led to recommendations aligning all the processes across the trades to improve quality of work and standardized practices across the trades. This application ultimately was built on top of our existing SAP CMMS system. So our field folks are able to actually go out now with their phones and perform their work orders in the field uh, rather than the historic process of taking field notes on paper, coming in at the end of the day and spending an hour in front of their computer, updating the work orders individually within SAP, as well as doing their timesheet within SAP. All of that is now handled right on the phone uh, for the folks in the field. Uh, so all these tools have been developed over the past four years. Uh, we use these tools now to continue improving our asset inventory like I said, perform the work orders. Uh, we're in the process of implementing condition inspection with the applications. Uh, we're collecting locational data for assets every day. Uh, and we're also creating reports using business intelligence software so that we can understand what we're getting out of our system along the way. Uh, next steps for us 
include that our technology systems will be integrated uh, between the data warehouse we've established, SAP, and our ArcGIS environment. Uh, and for our own continuous improvement, we plan to perform an asset management maturity assessment uh, and develop a formal strategic asset management plan. Uh, these steps will help us refine our goals and set us a straightforward path for the next three to five years. So to recap, we have accomplished a lot in five years at the port. Uh, it just wasn't exactly what we planned five years ago. Uh, but it's important to take a moment and look back at your successes and realize there won't be a finish line in asset management. Rather, it will become a fundamental business process for your organization. Uh, you can quickly see the eight things that I've highlighted here. We've accomplished the asset inventory early on, the decision making pro uh, for risk prioritization, developing our technical requirements, the architecture, uh, data model itself, our business process improvements, the Merville Workforce app, and the data management app. So here are some screenshots of the actual asset data manager application we built. Um, the first frame on the upper left is a high level summary of our planning districts, along with the assets in each one of those districts. Uh, on the upper right, we highlight the sublocations for each site. Uh, and a representation of the asset systems. So what user does is they come into the application, start from the master location on the left, and they drill their way down through the sub locations to uh, identify where they where they want to be in the application. Uh, on the bottom left is the map viewer. Once you've selected an asset, you can see it on the map, uh, so you can figure out where in the world it is. That is probably one of the most important things about uh, asset management in the industry we're in is understanding where your asset resides in the real world. Uh, and then finally on the bottom right is our asset inspection form. Very simple, straightforward form um, for doing the assessment. We really want to capture this information regularly when our folks are out doing their regular day-to-day -day work or they're just on tidelands making their way around for our facilities. Being able to quickly go in, give it a rating and a little condition score that's what we're looking for so that we can continuously improve the data all the time. Some of our reporting, uh, this is more early stage for us, but uh, upper left, you'll see the map views, all the assets we have in one of our park facilities, as well as that just park facility highlighted on the overall map of San Diego. Uh, on the right hand side, is a summary of the assets within that mapped area shown on the screen. Um, and in the bottom left is a high level summary of all the systems we have and the assets within each of those systems uh, so we can understand where most of our assets lie within our uh, facilities. And then for all the, the data nerds, that bottom right is just a complete um, documentation of all the asset, uh, asset information that we have for everything. So that concludes my presentation. Uh, I hope it was helpful and I'll enjoy it. Thanks, Christopher. Thanks, Christopher. We have uh, some bars. folks that are engaging in the chat bar and I would encourage uh, that to continue. Uh, we will be able to go through a complete Q&A at the end. It looks like we may have some time uh, to explore some issues that have been raised by our speakers. We now turn to uh, Vancouver Fraser Port Authority and Mo Mafrad and Sean Smith. So, gentlemen, please. Okay, uh, can you hear me? Yes. Yep, and okay. Sean here. So, um, uh, Mo, I'll, uh, I'll open my uh, screen here and yes, uh, share that. And then, uh, so Mo's gonna start and uh, I'm just gonna, uh, uh, advance the slides as uh, as Mo's going, and then I'll take over for the uh, the second part of it. So. Thank you, Sean. So just by way of uh, introduction, um, I'm Mo Mofrat, project engineer, uh, manager of asset management and special data group uh, with the Port of Vancouver. I will be presenting with uh, 
with Sean, my colleague, uh, who's asset management uh, GIS integration specialist with the port. Uh, uh, Sean and I joined the port at the uh, outset of the asset management journey at the port uh, early in 2012. Um, we joined uh, the port from the private sector. Uh, we were working for consulting firms on asset management, and uh, when we joined the port, asset management was uh, top-down driven. It was uh, an initiative as a result of the vision of the executive uh, leadership at the port. So it was uh, like a breath of fresh air for Sean and I that we just joined, and our role was to uh, implement asset management at the port. Uh, so uh, this presentation... Uh, I will provide you with an overview of the Port of Vancouver and uh, follow by uh, our approach to asset management and development of asset management uh, roadmap. Sean will speak uh, about the development of engineering works program and a case study on shoreline uh, protection. And if uh, time allows, um, there, there's some uh, bonus slides about some of the techniques and technology and uh, our uh, means about uh, collecting data. Uh, who are we? Uh, the Vancouver Fraser Port Authority is, uh, uh, is our uh, legal business name, uh, refers to our organization, including uh, decisions we make, uh, the activities we undertake to fulfill our mandate. Uh, the Port of Vancouver uh, is kind of our brand name, refers to the physical lands and, and waters that uh, we manage. That includes all the uh, port terminals and uh, tenants. We are Canada's uh, largest uh, port, uh, home to 27 major terminals. Uh, our role is uh, to facilitate Canada's trade through the port with the most diverse uh, range of cargo. The uh, port operates across five business sectors, automobiles, uh, brake bulks, bulk and uh, container and cruise. Uh, we are financially uh, self-sufficient, self um, uh, corporation governed by a board of directors representing uh, government and industry across Canada. We are accountable to the Federal Minister of Transportation our mandate is to facilitate Canada's trade objectives, ensuring goods are, are moved safely, effectively, uh, while protecting the environment and uh, consider, in consideration of uh, working with our local uh, municipalities and, and local communities. Uh, what we do, um, well, we lease uh, federal lands. Uh, this, uh, the, the lease is to terminal operators, so we, as part of that we have real estate management, uh, tenant leases, purchase and sales uh, of lands. Uh, we have a planning department, so we review uh, projects uh, at the port, uh, land use and economic uh, forecast as part of our planning. Uh, oversee environmental programs, uh, safety and security of uh, lands and, and navigational waters, uh, all the shipping activities on local waters, and uh, transportation operations. Uh, we show efficient uh, movement of goods by roads, uh, work closely with uh, municipalities. We, uh, we uh, neighbor uh, some 16 uh, to 18 uh, municipalities and communities. Uh, so to facilitate uh, an efficient movement of goods, uh, the port invests uh, in the neighboring municipalities, uh, building, upgrading infrastructure in the transportation systems, removing bottlenecks in the uh, rail and road networks. Uh, so some of our unique challenges uh, are, uh, we are similar to municipalities in terms of what we uh, manage in terms of our assets uh, with the addition of the marine structures, but we, we don't uh, function like municipalities. Uh, we don't have populations. Uh, we, we, uh, we are not uh, tax-based, we self-finance. Um, our local presence uh, is of national importance, so we are risk averse, uh, we can't uh, tolerate uh, any uh, service uh, interruption. 
and uh, obviously the harsh environment of uh, being by the body of water and the ocean, salt water environment, high traffic and restricted areas, uh, which are really challenging to manage projects, project schedules uh, at the busy terminals with their safety and security and the uh, access to the berth structures are challenging. Um, so it makes uh, managing project schedule very difficult. Uh, to say the least. Uh, uh, Landlord-tenant uh, relationship, uh, it, it varies from location to location, Lease, uh, leases are different, so that offers uh, challenges to determine whose responsibilities uh, are maintenance of the given assets. So uh, just to show uh, uh, an overview of our due uh, uh, restriction, uh, we uh, have uh, some 18 uh, municipalities and, and the, uh, the terminals in our uh, uh, due restriction uh, moves on from grain to brake bulk, uh, petroleum, potash, and coal, autos. Uh, so uh, these are uh, about uh, different uh, 28 major terminals at the port. <clears throat> And uh, what uh, <clears throat> will come clear at the next slides is uh, how we operate uh, and what we manage. We uh, don't uh, manage things above ground. Uh, we prepare the port lands uh, and facilitate uh, services uh, for the operators to come and, and uh, gear their operations to manage uh, their operations. So we don't own any equipment at the <clears throat> on the uh, portlands, uh, cranes and uh, buildings <clears throat> are all owned uh, by the terminal operators and, and managed by terminal operators. So uh, just an overview uh, of the kind of um, assets we manage. We, we manage some 13 kilometers of deck, uh, docks, uh, dock structures, dock faces, 30 kilometers of Shore um, protection and nine overpasses, uh, 25 uh, cent, uh, center line kilometers of roadways, and uh, 2.8 million of uh, paved surfaces and parking and storage areas, and 270 kilometers of underground pipes and utilities. So the question that uh, the fundamental questions, basic questions that we we need to ask is. Uh, well, uh, what is it? Where is it? What condition is it in? And when should we uh, repair and replace? Uh, what method and cost? So we, uh, we see the major pillars for our systems uh, in asset management uh, being GIS, uh, GIS being the mainstay and back, backbone of our asset management. Uh, the, uh, recognizing the importance of having uh, all assets spatially referenced. Uh, and in addition to that, uh, the importance of, of one of the uh, most important component uh, is uh, the next pillar for us, uh, the life cycle cost analysis and capability to be able to do life cycle costing. Uh, for it's the greatest potential uh, for cost saving, offers the greatest return on investment, uh, lowest uh, cost over uh, long range. So in order to calculate uh, uh, life cycle costs, uh, we require to have the ability to uh, predict future. So predict future performance, we need uh, accurate performance modeling. In, in turn, uh, requires accurate location referencing. And this slide is uh, showing how we, uh, uh, we are, are can't uh, emphasize this enough, the importance of accurate location referencing. Uh, the, the, the key essential to data collection uh, is location referencing for us. Uh, it, uh, it ensures correlation and integrity of data. So they, this basically uh, shows a, a simple uh, view of uh, how we manage the dock structures uh, in terms of location referencing, the idea is to be able to go back to the same spot and, and uh, report and, and see progression of uh, deterioration and distresses in the same location. That would enable us to identify uh, the progression of de uh, deterioration and uh, develop uh, deterioration curves. And then uh, next slide, Sean, please. 
So back to what we uh, what we manage, um, Portland. Uh, we facilitate Portlands in by providing means for the operators to uh, receive goods in, uh, through uh, dock structures and marine structures. Uh, then we uh, service the land by uh, building roads and bridges and rail network. And within the land, we provide uh, underground utilities to facilitate the operator to come and, and um, suit the site uh, for their operations and, and the goods and cargo that they manage and operate. And uh, for this, uh, we, we have to uh, develop asset management plan for uh, different uh, critical assets, uh, multi-year program. You see a, a very uh, simple schematics of it. Uh, so we have uh, asset management uh, plans for uh, each uh, location uh, and for each critical asset. And then uh, next slide, Sean, please. But the challenges are uh, we need to uh, understand uh, prioritizing uh, the program. The, the plan needs to be uh, prioritized cross asset optimization and, and uh, how we uh, um, give it order of priority based on risk and revenue, return on investment, level of service. Uh, so each terminal uh, has uh, uh, differences in level of service requirement of risk and, and return on investment. So we, uh, we have to have uh, ability to do cross asset uh, optimization. And uh, in summary, the next slide, uh, Sean, please. <clears throat> is uh, our journey when we started and where we're at. Uh, we, we started off by um, in, in early 2012 uh, by collecting inventory data uh, through uh, what we call uh, L1 inspections to obtain a baseline condition rating, a high level inspection that is a, top, a tabletop inspection by visual checks, speaking to the terminal operators and our maintenance crews to so understand uh, challenges with the, with the assets in order to prioritize detailed investigation in the next process. But before we could get into do detailed condition assessment, uh, we really had to focus on developing standards, a standardization of uh, data collection uh, was a key for us. So, so we developed uh, standards, specification uh, for and procedures uh, for collection of data. So uh, because the collection and recollection of uh, inventory and condition data is uh, perhaps a single greatest expense uh, associated with uh, uh, implementation of our asset management system. Again, I can't emphasize uh, the importance of uh, of location referencing, a key essential to data collection is location referencing to ensure consistency, quality control, repeatability, correlation, and validation of data. And then uh, the ability uh, to, um, to uh, the capability for uh, life cycle cost analysis uh, to facilitate a more organized planned approach to uh, replacement of assets, repairing, in a manner that is cost effective. So with all that said, uh, I think the next uh, few slides and, and Sean uh, presenting a case study would bring all these principles in, in a manner that would, uh, would make it, on, uh, make it uh, show what they really look like in real term of application. So Sean, please uh, take it from here and uh, uh, move to your uh, part of the presentation. Thank sure. you. Okay. Um, well, just a, an overview of our, our asset classes. So uh, we have 14 separate asset classes. Uh, oh, that number could vary from uh, one port to the next, I suppose, but uh, this is how we broke it down. And within each of those classes, uh, we define assets and we look at things usually from the network level. Um, you know, we, we try not to get into considering things like individual fire hydrants and manholes and stuff as is independent assets, that's uh, just, just too much detail uh, and you'd be forever uh, trying to track all that. So, so we look at things from the network level and consider all those pieces to be uh, components of the asset as a whole. And you know, keeping in mind that uh, line of sight about assets that you know, the, a, an asset system is something that serves a function. So you know, whether an individual manhole or fire hydrant or uh, whatever 
is, uh, you know, needs that level of detail, probably not. It's the system that you need to look at. Is it performing the function that you need? So I uh, thought we'd uh, do a little case study on shoreline protect protection because it's, uh, you know, something kind of unique uh, for ports, uh, you know, inland municipalities and so on uh, don't often have this sort of thing. Uh, so everybody also calls it uh, riprap or rock armoring and it's to protect against erosion, of course, and uh, loss of land. Uh, we have uh, about 100 uh, defined uh, shoreline protection assets, uh, about 33 kilometers, and we've surveyed uh, at least two thirds of those. That number is probably a little bit higher now. And uh, a lot of these were built quite some time ago, you know, from the 60s and 70s onwards and uh, in various uh, conditions and states of repair. So our condition rating system, this is the, uh, the same standard that we apply to all of our assets. Everything is rated on the, uh, the same sort of system from very good to very poor. What helps is, uh, what, what do you mean when you say that something is in poor condition or good condition? So we have a, a description of what that means uh, and looking at say reliability and what your guess might be as to remaining life. So this starts getting into sort of a, you know, a risk-based assessment of, of what does a, you know, a term like very poor or very good mean. So the snapshot for uh, this asset class, uh, uh, looking at uh, the condition of all of the assets, this is actually from last year, but uh, this is probably about average for what it is today, uh, you know, ranging from very good to very poor. So, you know, we can kind of see at an instant uh, where we need to uh, spend our efforts on it and uh, what those costs will be. Uh, we've learned along, uh, Along this journey, what uh, the average replacement cost is, so $5,000 a linear meter, or that'd be uh, you know, $1,300 a linear foot sort of thing in, in Canadian dollars, so I'll let you do the translation. Uh, but it also gives us an idea of, uh, you know, if you had to replace everything, build it all brand new from scratch, you know, what would that cost? And, uh, and that's, you know, a figure with a lot of zeros. So, uh, you know, that gets the accountants uh, all excited, I'm sure. Uh, so it's just some snapshots of uh, what we mean by these condition ratings. So uh, you know, here's uh, the good, the bad, and the ugly, or in this case, uh, should be the very good because this is a uh, was brand new uh, riprap being constructed a couple of years ago, and it's uh, properly engineered. It has a design slope. It's uh, got a, a specific uh, sizing of rock to be used, all very angular and interlocking, and so on. Uh, it has to be the appropriate crest height. Uh, we'll do like a, sometimes a med ocean study, like you know, what kind of waves and wind conditions will it be, so that it's designed properly. Uh, the bad, um, this is stuff from the 70s, uh, back in the days when you could just back up a truck and dump it off the edge and say, hey, job done. You know, there, there was no design to this. You know, there's there's no record drawings or anything involved here. And this is everything from like, uh, you know, waste concrete, broken concrete, uh, uh, sidewalk slabs and everything, right? So it's it's a real mixed bag of stuff. And it's, uh, as you can kind of see, it's it's very overgrown along the crest area so it's very difficult to see whether it's uh, actually eroding along the top usually it is and that's quite hidden by all those blackberries so that's uh you know not the best situation and meanwhile you've got uh you know the upland area being used for storage like these containers here and the ugly well you know it's very clear that we're losing some land here uh structures and uh stored goods are being threatened trees are falling into the water and so on. And, you know, you really want to prevent things from getting to this sort of state. Uh, or, or in this case, you know, along this building here, that's uh, how long before this becomes a problem. Although I'm, I'm happy to say that uh, this has actually been repaired, so it doesn't actually look like this anymore. Um, so in, in asset management, or, you know, especially in the modeling, we always have to look at uh, what's the consequences of doing nothing. You know, if you have no budget to do this, no appetite to repair it, well, what can happen? So, you know, it, it ranges everything from complaints from your, your tenants, you can lose land, you, you'll ultimately lose revenues because you can't rent that out anymore, it becomes a threat to uh, your roads and rail infrastructure, buildings, uh, any storage, there could be contamination in the soil. There's a lot of regulatory difficulties involved if you have to start reclaiming this land. Uh, a lot of hoops and hurdles to go through for that, uh, that can, can be very costly and a lot of delays. Um, so you know, ultimately it's it's the, the do-nothing approach, as we know, for, with any type of asset is, is not sustained. So you have to make a good business case for why you need to do something. Uh, that's provided that the asset is still giving you some service. Um, well, snapshot of our, our multi-year program, uh, which is in our GIS. So we can get this instant picture of the good, the bad, and the ugly. 
what year that uh, the recommendation is to replace it, what the cost will be, and so on. Um, not every asset is uh, quite this slick in terms of how our modeling uh, multi-year program goes, but this is uh, kind of the goal. This is where we want to be with every type of asset class. And just getting back to that risk-based approach, uh, it's it's a good way to prioritize repairs. You know, everybody has the same problem with there's not enough money to go around to everything. So how do you choose? So with shoreline protection, the obvious answer was, well, what is the upland use of the site? Is it a vacant site? Well, then, okay, you could afford to lose a little bit of land. Uh, the consequences are pretty minor. It's an empty site. If it's just being used for parking, yeah, okay, you could... You know, you can move some cars out of the way. You lose a few parking spots. It's an inconvenience. You get into uh, roads and rail that are along the shoreline. This starts to become a big problem. You don't want to have roads closed or, you know, closed rail lines and so on. That's that's interrupting business. Uh, commodity storage, that's bad too. You could lose goods, uh, spills, contamination. And then when you get into offices and workshops, occupied places, now you're talking about structural damage, safety of life. So. Uh, the risk-based approach is, uh, you know, a, a very good way of uh, trying to prioritize where you focus your repairs. Uh, so that's that's it. I see we're already over our 20 minutes. Uh, so, uh, Eric, if if we have time, uh, I've got a few more slides, or or maybe we could save that till uh, after the uh, the rest of the presentations are done. Sean, why don't you go ahead? I think I think we're in pretty good shape. Um, got a few more minutes. Go ahead. All right, sure. I'll. I'll carry on here. So the uh, the couple of bonus things I had was uh, what we call sea view and some uh, multi-beam bathymetry. So uh, sea view, uh, everybody's probably familiar with Google Street View. Um, you can uh, jump into a map anywhere and go see what, a, what things look like right from the street. So we thought, well, this would be great to apply this to shorelines. You know, why can't we just drive around with a boat and take a lot of pictures, uh, which is what we did. So we used one of our work boats and um, a GPS-enabled camera. And just took a lot of pictures, just a continuous series, um, and in in sort of a controlled manner, like you know, you always have to think of the same view perspective, the same zoom level, try to get overlapping photos and so on, and then those locations into GIS, uh, put that into our maps and request system. So now this is a layer available for all of our employees to use. You can just turn this on, click on a dot, pops up the picture, and then you can see, oh, what does this shoreline look like? What does this dock structure look like? Uh, is is there an outfall here and so on? Um, so a little bit of larger example there, um, and also try to take it uh, as many as possible during low tide periods, of course. And it's got a little uh, data header across the top, tells you uh, where this is, what date and time it was taken, what the tide level was, and so on. So a little intelligence besides just a pretty picture. And then uh, the, the next iteration of this, we thought, let's try and be a little bit smarter this time around. Uh, and we'll contract out to a company that uh, uses a UAV. They can cover a lot of ground very quickly with UAV. Um, trouble is you need to get to these places. So we used one of our patrol boats as uh, the aircraft carrier and uh, happy to say that uh, out of like 20 separate flights, uh, we never dunked it in the water once. So that was a bonus. And uh, so now you can kind of get a little bit more of an eagle eye view, We're trying to do it from a bit of a angled perspective so that uh, you, know, you can kind of see you know, what uh, the shape of things are. Um, it's not the uh, the perfect angle, but uh, you know we're kind of working on what uh, what works best, and um, it's just some extra details for what it took to uh, to do that, and then just the uh, bathymetry shot. So we're, we've been making a lot of use of the multi-beam bathymetry. This is fantastic technology. This example here is uh, along a dock structure that has a sheet pile wall, which you can't really see very well in itself, but what you can see is a big scour hole in the riprap that supports that sheet pile wall. That riprap was uh, blown out by the action of uh, very powerful tugboat propellers. Uh, so we had that repaired. And this is just a snapshot from the same data in GIS uh, using a shaded relief and uh, color coded elevations. So the before and after gives you a very good idea to see, OK, has this been repaired uh, to the, uh, the degree that we wanted to have it done? And uh, so when we get into the nitty gritty of some of these uh, sort of things, it's uh, a great tool for that as well. So that's all I've got. Over to you, Eric. Thank you, Sean. Well, we do have some time. Um, Sean Herpelsheimer, have you, uh, I, I know we had, uh, I saw one raised hand and uh, we had a chat question for Ann Porter who answered it, but I might like 
uh, and to respond more generally to the limitation of the her GIS to to stormwater, and then we'll go to the raised hand that I saw earlier. You responded on chat to Leslie, but perhaps I, you can share that. I did respond, and thank you for the question. Um, and I think it's a great one because it points to the the challenges with having a decentralized management. So um, stormwater management, they, their director wants GIS. They get revenues from their stormwater fees. They're willing to pay for it. The other operating divisions um, have not asked for that. And so if it's been proposed, it, it typically will come with a, a very high price tag. And so far, they are not willing to, um, to, to fund that. And really, I think back to Ryan's presentation, it is something that you would want a top down approach. You really want that driven by the business needs. And so you want your sponsors and, and your executives to be asking for that. And so far they have not. Great, thank you. Uh, is, uh, is Robert Lewis uh, still on the, on the call? I saw uh, you had raised your hand. Uh, yes, still here. Um, Please. Uh, can you hear me all right? Yes. Yeah. Um, well, I was uh, just very interested in the use of uh, uh, UAV drones, and I see that Vancouver is using them quite extensively. I was wondering if in, in San Diego and Seattle they uh, also were able to see that as a, a, a tool to use in asset management. I can speak to that for San Diego. Um, we have been using UAV for the last uh, few years uh, on projects. We do, do a lot of topographic analysis with it, uh, but we haven't uh, gone forward yet with using it in asset management. And it's not for lack of interest, but uh, actually has to do with the limitations of FAA uh, flight path. Uh, here in San Diego, our airport is right on top of our uh, bay. And so we, we've got to work closely with the FAA to allow us to actually fly our drone across most of our property. Right. Understand that. Here in Chicago, uh, we have the same same issue. Um, we've got uh, Midway and O'Hare, and they fly over everything. So yeah. our uh, ability to uh, do flights is uh, heavily regulated, let's say. Uh, Robert. Sorry, I wanted to add, Robert, this is Daniel Elroy. Uh, one of our larger port clients um, tried using UAVs for engineering purposes, but the labor unions um, didn't want to be photographed from above. And so they required advance notice of any survey activity and that sort of um, kind of put a, uh, a dampener on, on that until they can figure out a, a workable system. Interesting. So uh, labor was um, saw that maybe as a as an identity threat. Uh, I'll, I, I won't say any more. Yeah. Yes, uh, perhaps. Hello. Uh, my name is Wuti Tan and I'm from the port at the Coma. And I, I could add that uh, there's the same issue we had at the port <laughs> with respect to a labor relation with any any uh, mobile device attached to including vehicle, that kind of stuff. But I have a question for Christopher uh, from the Port of San Diego about using Power App and with uh, uh, SAP. I wonder if all the data model that uh, you folks uh, design and store for asset, enterprise asset management, eventually end up in inside uh, SAP. Uh, and also SAP have a sort of enterprise asset management system and I wonder if if your team tap into that too or or just the financial aspect of it or other functional aspect of uh, SAP thank you so um, that's a great question it, it time will tell if we migrate our asset database to the SAP environment uh, right now we've chosen to go down the power app way because uh, it's it's much easier platform to work with uh, when it comes to setting up databases and managing it through the applications. Um, it also is a 
function of the organizational readiness. As I said earlier, right, some areas of the business aren't ready yet for what we want to accomplish. Our SAP environment is in uh, an older generation, so we haven't had access to HANA yet or uh, the new asset uh, management tools that they've built in the last couple of years. That was on our roadmap, um, but with COVID, that, that's all time dependent at this point. Great, thanks Christopher. Sean, have you uh, noted that there might be other? There is a question in the chat from Miklo Bianco for Mo and Sean from Port of Vancouver. Um, if the Port of Vancouver manages assets at a system level, how do you manage individual component failures that can adversely affect LOS provisions by the overall system? Yeah, that's uh, an excellent question. Um, it's, uh, it, it is a challenge to uh, come up with a, a rating for an asset, knowing that it's a, a network level asset when there can be parts of it that are in poor shape. Um, and this, this is where we do kind of rely largely on uh, the quality of the, uh, the level one and level three reports that, that we have done on uh, assets to, to, to report some of these detailed problems where, uh, where they do see them. Like, um, you know, I guess what we try to do is say, well, if, if an asset is in overall good condition or can be restored to good condition with some minor maintenance, then that's probably the condition that it should be reported in. But do note those details to us so that we can put in, uh, you know, maintenance work orders if it's, you know, hopefully a more minor maintenance item to have those things done to, you know, fully enable it to come back to that, uh, Sort of uh, level of condition and level of standard. Um, I don't know, Mo, is there anything else you wanted to add to that? Uh, uh, just uh, routine maintenance activities. Uh, uh, you see, our asset management is always uh, complemented by uh, orderly maintenance activities. So uh, we have uh, uh, programs for exercising valves on, on water systems and, and flushing up the systems in, in uh, storm and sanitary. So, um, and, and these are all opportunities to get back as uh, where uh, the uh, failures may be. And um, so the maintenance activities and, and tracking those uh, is key for us uh, to, uh, to have a better understanding of the integrity of the system. Yeah, I guess it's, it's kind of like, uh, I, I always love going back to the, the analogy of, of owning a car. If you uh, said that, uh, you know, your car is in great condition, except that you have a flat tire. Well, okay, you're not driving anywhere today, uh, but in that larger picture, all you have to do is fix that flat tire, and then you can go somewhere. So, uh, that's kind of the uh, uh, you know decision maker as to you know do you keep this car or not, right? Uh, it's it's not like it's a junker you have to get rid of, but it does need that maintenance. Great, thanks, Mo. We got another question from Ryan. Ryan, if you wanted to go ahead and just unmute and ask that out loud. Yeah, sure. And I I, uh, I can share my screen just to show it if anybody's interested, but. Uh, yeah, go right ahead. Oh, okay, great, I'll do that. Um, or I'll, I'll share my application. Let me try that. Are you seeing uh, just a really vanilla black and white standard? That's what we're seeing. Okay, so. Um, this comes from the, the petroleum field. Uh, however, um, <clears throat> ISO 14224 is a, is a backbone standard that's used by organizations in, in every industry I've come across um, to help crack the nut. I'm not saying this is the way to do it. It's a great benchmark to look at to start to think about a risk-based asset hierarchy and delineating a component or a lowest maintainable unit um, to as that rolls up to the asset, as that rolls up to an asset system. And just um, very quickly, just to give you a nickel tour, there's a bunch of definitions and things, but uh, it uses the concept of a boundary diagram. So, um, the boundary itself forms the asset. 
these are these boxes are components. Any one of these components fails, it can make the whole asset fail. And then, of course, the asset itself, in this case, this is a, a boundary diagram for a pump, exists within a larger asset system. So kind of the basic breakdown is, you know, you may have a bunch of gas turbines. Um, you have a particular turbine. Maybe it's a type of turbine or a subtype of your population of turbines. Within the turbine, you have all these different components, one of which might be a gas generator. Um, and then within that component, you have things like lowest maintainable units, where these would be the things you'd want to have on hand um, in immediate inventory, because if this if this rascal goes down, it brings this down, which in turn brings this down. So um, this standard, uh, it lays out uh, a format for um, basic um, categories uh, of, they call it equipment. Um, it's really uh, an asset. And it lays out, um, so it, it supports, when you get down to lowest maintainable units, it supports reliability-centered maintenance, right? So um, you can attach your failure data, um, so you have your failure uh, causes, um, you have different maintenance um, attribute items that you can attach to it all, uh, an indicative database structure. Um, so you have your different installations, um, asset inventory records, failure data, maintenance data. So it, it gives you a nice framework. If you're thinking about trying to wrap an existing CMMS system around your asset inventory, um, and then it just, it has a whole laundry list, just dozens and dozens and dozens of example boundary diagrams and um, the types of components that would make up the asset, failure codes, uh, so on and so forth. So it's, it's a great, I've seen organizations have great success in, uh, someone mentioned, I, I believe it was San Diego uh, that mentioned that the data model can be uh, one of the most difficult um, aspects. I couldn't agree more. And I just, this standard um, can really help just getting that, that that conversation started is all. So I just, I thought it might be valuable to bring this up. Thanks, Ryan. Are there any other questions? Well, Sean, I think this has been a, an, an excellent uh, uh, program that gets us started uh, down the asset, path, uh, asset management path. Um, it, we learned uh, we learned a great deal. Uh, I certainly did. Uh, asset management, uh, uh, perhaps ideally, is is top down, but it doesn't necessarily always start that way. Um, could be generated by those within the organization who have critical data needs. Uh, asset management uh, programs can utilize outside expertise, uh, outside consultants, but it must. It, gets to be difficult if it gets to be a, a bolted on consulting project. Um, uh, I, I don't want to interrupt if we have any other uh, comments uh, in my wrap up remarks. Um, it's clearly a journey uh, uh, and a process that needs to be integral to the organization itself. Uh, it can be tedious. Um, the a lot of the functionality uh, depends on upfront uh, requirements in terms of data, condition assessments, um, data harmonization. Uh, it's uh, Christopher's winding road, uh, but uh, ultimately uh, the value to the organization is there, provided that there uh, is a plan that, that lays out uh, what the expectations of the organization are for the asset management program. When and what to repair, we have scarce resources. How do we optimally use those scarce resources? Risk analysis is key. Geospatial referencing is critical for ports whose infrastructure spans large tracts of land and water. We heard condition assessments and IT systems also can be very expensive. Again, going back to the importance of planning. Uh, systems analysis is critical, uh, although the individual asset level can be important, it, it affects the operation of the organization and the organization's business goals. 
Uh, Eric, can I add something? This is of Daniel. course. So the theme of the the webinar today was successes along the way, and I think it's important to um, to remember what we were looking at here is not um, you know who who has reached the the top of the mountain and what does life look like from the top but who has been walking up the side of the mountain and has stopped to look back and seen, oh, we've accomplished something. Right. So in the case of Christopher, uh, as you said, uh, the organization wasn't ready back in 2014. So you uh, ended up taking a, I don't know if it was a left turn or a right turn, but you did a whole bunch of inventory and you did some self-assessment and you ended up going in a different direction than, than what you thought you would originally, you, you the port, not you, Christopher. Um, but what's important is that your, in this case, your GIS and your inventory has improved significantly along the way. And that has other purposes, uh, for, you know, mapping and, and police security, uh, uh, inventory for loss prevention and, and all that sort of uh, thing. Um, and I think that's the important part because, uh, Anne said, well, Ryan said, and then Anne reiterated that. And Eric, you just said it, that sometimes there isn't top level support when you need it. Uh, sometimes you have to wait, sometimes a few years until you get the right leadership that gets it. But if you can look at the incremental benefits that can be accrued along the way, those don't necessarily require as much of an uh, executive buy-in. Those can be departmental or division buy-ins, and those are not insignificant. Um, and so when when the question is is thrown at at visionaries faces of what's my return on the investment in this big program uh if if the ears aren't there to hear it then maybe the message can be a little bit smaller look you know on the way to asset management we need uh data harmonization I'll put it in some you know normal language but you know what what, what i mean data harmonization proper asset uh, hierarchy, you know, like Ryan was just saying, what's what's an asset and what's a component? Um, all that homework can have um, incremental real value, right? Ar real ROI along the way. And and I think that one of the things we're trying to do with the, um, the SharePoint website for this committee, which, uh, which I hope you, you all will show, uh, you know, interest in joining, uh, is to put case studies there, um, some of which can be these incremental um, return on investment case studies. So I just wanted to throw that in. No, there. that was great. Fantastic. Thanks, Daniel. Really appreciate that. Um, we've got additional comments. I would uh, echo what Daniel just said. Uh, we, we have a, a committee that will welcome your, uh, your engagement. Uh, uh, Please join uh, ASCE and then sign up for our asset management committee. We um, we plan on having quarterly meetings. We will have uh, webinars as needed. I will say that one topic of current interest is defining uh, an asset required level of service. What is appropriate for given asset, given asset class in terms of uh, attaining a fit for purpose standard? Uh, it, it's not intuitive uh, and it varies uh, across your asset portfolio. There are a, m a multitude of, of issues. Uh, I see something along the lines of uh, power apps for the Port of Houston asset management, which is, I mean, there, there are so many issues that we can, that, that we need to take on. We welcome you and we welcome you all to join our journey. Um, Please reach out to me or Sean or any of the folks on the call. You see our contact list uh, with questions or for more information. Um, slide availabilities, I'm, I'm sure, will, will be made to you uh, should you ask. Uh, if, uh, let, let me add one more thing. We've got Michelo Bianco, who is a guest here, uh, formerly um, of the Port of Melbourne, Australia, uh, which I, I think is we can fairly confidently say is is the global is is in the global best uh, of class uh, category. 
Uh, we have international folks like Mick uh, who will share their experiences. They started a little bit ahead of the North American ports in this space and, and can help us work through some of the issues that they already have, have gone through. Uh, we've got folks like uh, uh, Hang Boat from the Port of Rotterdam, uh, again, uh, who has started on this journey and, and uh, are, are happy to, to share their experiences with us. So um, please join the committee. Um, you're, you're, you're welcome to participate. Uh, in the meantime, as I said, please reach out uh, with any questions. Uh, Sean, if if there's nothing else, um, our, and there's there's your uh, contact information. Thank you, Sean. If there's nothing else, then I will thank you all and and wish you all um, uh, safety in this crazy global um, environment that we're in right now. Be safe, take good care, and um, manage your assets. Thanks to all of our presenters and everybody who attended. Have a great day. Thank, Thank you. Bye. Thanks, everyone.